and I realized that I had grown, I had grown the company successfully, but I had, I had begun to multiply instead of duplicate. And so the multiplication was by reputation, uh, by hard work, uh, blood, blood, sweat, and tears, as she mentioned. Duplication is when you have processes and systems in place and everyone everywhere is doing the exact same thing. And so the core of what made us successful was no longer happening in some of the areas that were a little bit further away from, um, from, my, from my reach. So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined again by Amanda Barkey, um, who, as you know, is one of our fellow EOS implementers. But this time she's actually enjoyed by her husband, Joe Ben, as well. And so um, Amanda and Joe Ben actually work in business together. They are an owner of the Soccer Shots franchise, as well as obviously Amanda being an EOS implementer. So welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for so. having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to yeah. be here. I'm really looking forward to chatting to both of you. So we heard a lot from Amanda in one of the previous episodes about, you know, um, what you guys have been doing and what she's been doing, particularly as an EOS implementer. I'd love to hear a little bit of your side of the story, Joe Ben. So how did you get involved in the business that you're in now? Um, how did you get it to where it is? And of course, we should definitely talk about the fact that you've won the Rockstar of the Year Franchise Award and what that actually meant. Thank you. That'd be awesome. Um, how did I get started? I, well, I think I, I, I think most entrepreneurs if they're honest with themselves, they were always an entrepreneur. So it was just a matter of discovering that about myself. Um, I grew up in South America and so I didn't have a lot of opportunity to pursue, um, to pursue that side of myself. And so when I went to university, I had no idea. I, I got a BA in psychology. Um, I should have taken business courses. Um, uh, but I, I just, I always looked at people who owned businesses and I thought that's so cool. I have no idea how to do that. I wish someone would tell me. And, um, I had a friend that went in, uh, that bought a franchise, bought into a franchise system. And he called me, he was like, you should do this. It's a perfect fit for you. And I said, no. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> it took about three years and, and then we were flying to my parents' house and I said to Amanda, I'm like, man, my friend is going to be there. The one that keeps talking to me about starting a business. I need to have a really good reason why I'm going to say no. And Amanda in a moment of clarity said, why would, why? Like, why would we go into that conversation with prepared ammunition for why we're going to say no? Why not just have an open mind and, and consider it? And so that uh, we had that conversation towards the end of uh, actually probably about the middle of December. And by December 31st, I was on the phone with the franchise owner and I was uh, I was entered into a verbal agreement to purchase two franchises. I said, verbal handshake over the phone. I'll commit to two franchises right now. And this is back in the days of the wild, wild west. He said, done deal. And that was the start of our adventure. Oh, fantastic. I do have a question for you, though, because it's, it's one that I always find really fascinating because, of course, EOS is actually a franchise as well. And so we are all franchise owners or licensees. Why did you choose a franchise versus starting a business from scratch? That's a great question. <sighs> um <laughs> I've definitely had some frustrations over the years connected to the fact that I am a franchisee. I think what attracted me the most in the early days is that it was a very early entry into a franchise system. And so I was put into a group of like-minded people that were innovative, that were trying to create something. And fortunately our franchisors uh, were of the mindset that together we could create something better than what they would create on their own. And so uh, they, they, they had the idea they had the framework and they let us work together to help build it out. So we had a ton of committees in the early days. There were only um, about 17 of us in for those five, first five years or so, and maybe a little bit shorter time than that, but the 17 of us, we all just picked multiple um, uh, committees to be on. And we just like, no, we had some guys that had background in marketing. So perfect fit. Some people that had background in education. So great fit for writing curriculum for what we do. And so we just kind of picked, uh, picked committees that we thought we could help with. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like my attraction to the franchise system model and community was, oh, like-minded people building something together. This sounds like fun. And as a high visionary people person celebration, uh, the more the merrier type of a person, it just was really attractive to me. So I think it would be hard for me to enter into a really well-established franchise system as a brand new franchisee, because I would miss that, that creative side of, of, um, of building the business, but the yeah. collaboration 
coupled with being a very early entry into the system meant that I got to participate in that creative side of building a business and have the community right away. Also, I mentioned I took one business class in college or in university. I, I have a BA in psychology, but I did take one business class. And in that class, I distinctly remember the professor, Professor Grone, talking about um, the success rate and failure rate of businesses um, compared to franchise systems. And so I already knew in the back of my head that the success rate was much, much, um, much higher it, within a franchise system. And I think that community is a big part of it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And it's probably part of the reason that Amanda and I you know, joined the EOS thing is because you've already got an established brand, you've already got a community, but you're still running your own business. This is not like, you know, even though you're, you're given help from the franchise, yet you still actually have to run your own business. So tell us a little bit about that, that, that journey. Like when did you buy the first two franchises? 2009, beginning in 2009. I bought them 2000. when we lived in Canada and I bought them in Orange County, California. And so it took about six Ooh. months to get out of everything I was doing in Canada and get down here and start uh, start running the business. And um, my own threshold for what I thought was success was so low that, you know, day one, I'm like, we're killing it. There's 63 <laughs> kids enrolled. And so yeah. I look back on those days and I still laugh about what I thought was arriving um, and then where we are today. It's It's been so cool to see that, uh, that, um, yeah, well, yeah, well, well, this year we're going to have 10,000 players in our program. And so wow. to be to be stoked about 63 kids and then yeah. to be looking at the number 10,000, it's just like, how did that how did that happen? And that's a really good question. So how did that happen? <laughs> uh, a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of pace in the backyard. Of really, yeah a really frustrating moment in the early years, reinvesting in ourselves over and over again, mm -hmm. um, making no money, working way too many hours. Uh, I think, I think, were tough. I think it, it, a lot of it started with um, just this really focused vision that I had. I did not want to create a job for myself. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create mm -hmm. an organization. And so the process of creating an organization is not nearly as profitable as the process of creating right. a job. But I, I knew we wanted to have a big family, wanted to have a lot of kids. And I, I told myself, I'm willing to miss those first. I, I said when Asher, our firstborn, when he was five years old, I said, I, I can put up with missing the fun events when I'm the one that's bummed out that I'm missing. But I want to be able to be there when missing would mean that he was bummed out I wasn't there. And so mm -hmm. I figured around four or five years old, that's when he was he would be really noticing. I mean, this was all projecting, right? I had no idea. I, I never had a kid that turned five before. And so I was just projecting that by four or five, I figured they'd really want me around. And I said, at that point, I want to be the dad that is attending the poorly scheduled 1 p.m. Uh, school performance. Like I wanted to be the dad that was front row for all that stuff. And I was yeah. willing to miss the first years. And I I think we were willing to make a lot of sacrifices mm -hmm. knowing that that's what we were trying to build. We are, mm -hmm. we know that time is a currency, right? So for us, that's a very important to us and it's integral to who we are spending time with our kids and investing in them is invaluable. So to us in the beginning years, we were willing to sleep on floors and eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and do what it takes to build something that we had this, large grand vision for and now 13 years later we are there and it's all paying off so we're super grateful i do and love that in the early years our children thought that uh department store shopping carts were go-karts because we would wait till things closed and then uh we 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 had our own schedules we ran our own schedules so we would wait till things closed and then we would go there put the kids in the shopping cart and amanda would get out a stopwatch and I would, I would push the kids in the cart and then jump on the cart with them. And we would race across the cart around trees and come back. And Amanda would time it. We'd make up courses. Um, and, and the kids thought we were racing go-karts. And so <laughs> it just, for me, it was just an er And that was at two and three or one and two years old. Um, it just was a, a affirmation and, and a, uh, an encouragement for me that, that we didn't have to spend money on things for our kids mm -hmm. if, we could, if we could spend time. And yeah. so I, I was willing to, to not buy all the toys, to not do all the stuff. We live 17 minutes away from Disney and we've never taken our kids. Uh, now it's almost like a badge of honor that we don't take them. <laughs> but but 
um, we just found so many other ways to have a great time with them without breaking the bank. And yeah. uh, we were able to keep reinvesting, keep purchasing more territories. And um, I mean, we were right. It, it took off. There's 240 franchise locations now. Um, and so it, it was a really good idea, a good business model, and you were providing something for your community that, um, if done well, could really serve families and um, in, in a really convenient way so that parents could um, have their kids participate in, in activities without having to pick them up from school and then take them because we would partner with the schools and run it on site. And so it was a convenience. Um, there's a convenience factor to it. And then also my whole family, our whole background is in education. And so the, our curriculum has a strong education component to it. And our, our curriculum is rolled out in a very age appropriate way. And so I'm really proud of the fact that it, that even though I was the black sheep growing up, everybody else went into education and I was the one who, I was in this way more into sports. Uh, and I was the entrepreneur. We're always a little bit different at the party. Um, I still found a way to incorporate education into what we do. And then with my background, having grown up in a third world country, uh, the, the giving side of what we do, the nonprofit side, I just, I had this understanding that's not typical for someone who, who maybe would fit my profile of, of the economics of a third world country and how to have a positive impact there. Cause not every dollar you spend is positive when you, when you go on um, some of these communities. And so for the example I like to use is you see the, the community group go down, do a project. Maybe they'll take a t-shirt, they do, do a two week camp for the kids. They'll take a t-shirt for all the kids. It makes for a great like photo opportunity, but, um, but that family that maybe made and sold t-shirts for three generations, now they're out of a business because every child in the community just got a brand new t-shirt for the last of a year. And yeah. so just, just thinking through things like that, how can we have a sustainable impact that doesn't disrupt local entrepreneurs and local families? Um, and how can we uh, provide some that supports the community long-term? And so I knew I wanted to do that. I didn't feel it as, um, as a burden or guilt or anything like that. I just was excited about an opportunity. And so I think for me, the biggest frustration in the delayed long time it takes to, to grow and really get to where you want to be was I just was like, man, we, I just want to start helping these people. And so um, that, that was the lesson learned. It was how, how early you can actually start helping people. You don't have to have a ride to begin helping people. Um, and so I was able to get a lot of fulfillment and, and feel a lot of reward from our business uh, because of the projects we were doing that we were funding through the business. And so I, I, I pretty quickly was able to talk myself. Uh, well, well, they say that sometimes it's really hard for an entrepreneur or a founder to hand things over to other people. I had no problem doing that. I was trying, <laughs> I was, it was very obvious that I was hiring people that were better than me. Very obvious, very early. So I was like, oh no, you, that's definitely, you should definitely be doing that, not me. Please don't run it by me. I don't want to be in the loop at all. I just want to talk through ideas. And so mm -hmm. I was because we we focus on building the organization. I was able to build the job within that organization that I that I wanted, my dream job, which was just coming up with twenty uh, outlandish ideas every uh, every year. And then I just had to fire. I had to find the person who would help me identify which one of the twenty was the one we were going to go forward with, and which nineteen were just shiny objects that I was chasing like a squirrel around the backyard. So yeah. I, I, um, I really feel like the, the, just to, to touch on one thing that you said, I really feel like the, what the franchise system allowed me is it gave me access to, um, to a CFO that I would never have had access to, to ask mm -hmm. questions, give me access to a marketing professional because of our pooled resources. I, yeah. we, uh, the franchisor was able to hire way higher quality and caliber mm -hmm. people than I could ever have hoped to hire in the early days. And so early on, I was able to get a lot of really, really high quality um, feedback and advice. And so that was a huge benefit. That's one of the reasons why I think we were able to build such a strong organization was because the early days of being in a franchise organization, I was able to get so much good advice. Wow, that is awesome. So you obviously use EOS in your business. Um, and how did you kind of come across that? And how did that get into be uh, integrated into your business? That's a great question. I, I, uh, I was introduced to EOS because I ran into the brick wall. I, <laughs> I was pacing around. I was, we, we had multiple locations for our business. We'd expanded to Florida. Um, and, and so for those who don't know, Florida and California are on opposite coasts. And mm -hmm. so a five and a half hour flight between the two. And I, I just started to lose control of wherever I wasn't at. 
And I realized that I had grown, I had grown the company successfully, but I had, I had begun to multiply instead of duplicate. And so the multiplication was by reputation, uh, by hard work, blood, blood, sweat, and tears, as she mentioned, duplication is when you have processes and systems in place and everyone everywhere is doing the exact same thing. And so the core of what made us successful was no longer happening in some of the areas that were a little bit further away from, um, from my, from my reach. And Mm -hmm. so I, I called my friend, Tim, and I said, who, who's an EOS implementer now, he wasn't at the time. Okay. And I was like, Tim, I've lost control of my business and I don't know what to do. And he said, oh, well, he, he listened to me for 30 minutes, go through all the examples, right? I'm a, I'm a classic visionary. I had many, many examples and stories of how I lost control. And at the end of it, he said, can I summarize what you said in just a sentence or two and then provide you some feedback? And I said, yes. And could you please follow me around for the rest of my life and summarize 30 minutes into two sentences <laughs> everywhere I go? And so he said, no, I can't provide that. But he said, um, it sounds like you have, um, you have reached a point where you realize that you need to delegate responsibilities without abdicating your responsibility to see your company succeed. Would that be accurate? And I was like, yes. (laughs) And he said, it sounds like you're ready to read a book. It's called traction. And so he sent me the book and I, Mm I, I went through, I got through it. uh, I read the entire book cover to cover twice in 11 days. And wow. it was everything I, before back then we didn't have what the heck is EOS. We didn't have the little like bite sized morsel to give you a little tease. It was like, you're eating, you're, you're feeding yourself the, the entire encyclopedia Britannica series, <laughs> in one book. And what the reason I just kept going and going is all these things that I, I had created parts of, they were on spreadsheets. They were um, just, I mean, they were very, low quality versions of what, of what Gino had already perfected. Um, I was like, Oh, this is so much better. Oh, this is exactly what I was trying to do. Oh, this is amazing. Right. And, uh, and so I just read through it and then I went back to my team and I already had a leadership team in place. I didn't know to call them that at the time, but I already had a leadership team in place. And so I went back and I said, Hey, this is what we're going to do. It's pretty intense. And so I'm going to take, uh, the next three, two to four months, and I'm going to dedicate 300 tracked hours to studying this operating system. And then we're going to do it. And I, I didn't really even know about implementers at the time. And so I thought my only real option was self-implementing at the time. So yeah. I read the book and then I discovered there were other books that supplemented help. And so I just started, I read every book uh, within probably that year. I'd read every book that had been put out at that point. This was 2015 going into 2016. And then we rolled it out. And one of the greatest quotes I grabbed onto, because uh, because I'm a, I'm a feeler, so people come and they they give me all the reasons it's not working, why they feel they're being pushed out, like why they feel it's wrong, all this stuff. Gino has this quote where he says, "When they come and tell you that it's not working, what they're telling you is that they're not working." And so it gave me permission to feel, uh, to to maybe not feel badly when they were telling me, you know, this doesn't work and this is uncomfortable and I don't like this and I'm already too busy. I, I, pr- I may have accepted I'm already too busy trying to do all the things you've asked me to do as a legit answer uh, until I got to Gino's quote there. And I'm like, but this this is a little bit of extra work up front, but it makes all of our lives so much easier, more structured, more organized. And as someone who is a high visionary, I'm not naturally structured. And so fitting my ideas and my energy into a structured system, I told them this is going to make all of your lives better. Because right now, just as one example, right now, when I have a thought pop into my head and I'm like, oh, have we taken care of that? I'm going to call you, even though it's not due for two weeks or months even. I'm going to call you right now because I might forget. Now, you're in the middle of a project. You're deep (laughs) in that project. You're, you know, you're at step five of eight. You're very focused. And then the phone rings and it's your boss. So you're going to answer it. But that pulls you out of that creative, uh, really focused um, um, workflow. yeah, workflow that you're in at that point. And now you're in like answer Jobin's disorganized line of questioning. <laughs> and so now you're as scattered as I am. And then you go back and now it's four fifteen. you have 45 minutes left. You, you actually don't get anything done. And now the project, you have to reapproach it the next day. I said, or we have structured check-in points. We have measurables that let me know if things are on track. And then if I have questions, 
I look at, at that. I look at our numbers. I go back and I look at our last meeting and I go and I'm like, oh, that's not due for two weeks. I'm not going to bother them with that. Uh, and so I, I'm like, this is going to free you guys from, from constantly being pestered by the boss. And so, and I have to say, then you also have the issues list. So you can put your ideas on the issues list, knowing that they will get addressed at the next level 10 meeting. So it actually gives you as the leader freedom. It frees your mind from that burden of carrying that around. Yeah. And we jumped right on traction tools, which is now bloom, bloom, Mm -hmm. bloom growth. And they had a great little feature where you could text issues to yes. the the issues list the platform that was yep. me all day every day just just sitting there texting <laughs> That's so yeah. great. I know. She I actually, I actually use 90 IO and they have an app and I do the same thing. I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I'll actually kind yeah. of go, Oh, I've got, to, I'm going to put that in there just because I think this is a thing. We, we talk a lot about the issues list in EOS and people see that as being a negative, but in actual fact, it is a great holding place for yeah. all of that yeah. stuff to be there. And they don't have to be negative things. They could be an opportunity. They could be, they could be an issue, but they're not always yeah. negative. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you, you self-implemented and have you always self-implemented or did you eventually get some help with that? You're looking yeah. at it. <laughs> so that, I mean, that was my, that was my, let's get super honest moment. So yeah. about a year ago, I had always thought I was going to be an EOS implementer. Uh, okay. 2018 was the first conference I went to and I recruited 22 people to attend with me. EOS still hasn't given me free tickets to go to any of the uh, conferences, uh, even though I've recruited so many people. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I just was, I just loved it. I love that it solved so many things that I thought were going to take years for me to sort through, to, to build out and then to install my own business. It was already all created. So I was so grateful. Um, it, it got me out of some challenging situations because I was able to lean on the system and blame, blame the system. Right. Mm. Uh, and so I, I always picture myself doing it and, um, if you were a betting person, I would put money on me eventually doing it. I think I probably <laughs> will. But I started to feel um, anxious just thinking about it. And I think the anxiety was was connected to, man, I've been in a grind for 13 years. I've been grinding and building this and just kind of just arriving, just arriving in a business that is completely employee led, that is is profitable, um, that affords me opportunities to, to do things I, I want to do outside of the business uh, to spend time with people I want to spend with, you know, I was living the EOS life and now I'm going to go back to grinding again. And mm-hmm. so I think I was starting to feel like, like that reality check of Joe, you never stop and charge your batteries. And this is a 13 year build that requires some, some battery recharge afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm certainly not done with the company. I, it's just my, my, my responsibilities have evolved to the point where I do have more flexibility now. And so okay. I just, was coming out of 2020, uh, trying to be more honest with myself and, and, and I'm a yes person. And so trying to be better at, at understanding when all the signs are actually saying, no, don't push with a yes. Cause it's not going to turn out well. And so I just turned to Amanda and I was like, what about you doing it? Like, you know, you, you understand this. You've, we've talked EOS around the din- like the dining room table, Around, well, actually, let's be honest, around the breakfast table, the lunch table, the dining room table, <laughs> uh, laying in bed at night, tucking the kids in. We talked to our kids about EOS. Like, yeah, so yeah. Like, you know all this. It's all in there. Why don't you do it? And within 24 hours, Amanda was off doing it. So here was my honest moment. As I'm sending her out the door, I said, hey, babe, uh, so we've been self-implementing for eight years. And you're about in, in about two days, you're going to know more about implementing than I have figured out in eight years. And you're going to figure out that some things have been done incorrectly. Uh, <laughs> and so I said, don't feel like I don't, when, when you get there and you're like, oh no, Joe has been doing it wrong. I know I'm doing it wrong. I know that. <laughs> I'm a very high scoring visionary. I have no skill set that correlates to an integrator. And so when a very high scoring visionary is in charge and usually we quit 80% through every project, it's like not the right person to do it. But when it's me or nobody, then me, then I'm the right person. So I just say, when you come back and you have all these things that we're doing wrong, I'm not going to challenge that. I already accept, I know it, I accept it, I acknowledge it, come back as our implementer and fix it. And so we actually, we pay Amanda from our, from the company that, that I am the CEO of, we pay Amanda as our implementer to come in and we have a very strong team, very, very respectful team. And so they're, uh, Amanda's not treated as like the CEO's wife. 
She's yep. the boss of a different company we brought in. And, and when we're in that meeting, like I'm definitely not in charge. Definitely. Mm. Um, and, I, and so I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm, I just, I'm really curious to know, you know, what, were there any things that they weren't doing quite right, Amanda? Oh my oh gosh, my yes. Gosh. I should <laughs> sit out of the room right now. <laughs> so I, that was the hold point. on, hold on. For all self out there, love, uh, compassion, sure. all that stuff, but no, and I have the utmost terrible. respect and admiration for self implementing because look, they're running their business and mm-hmm. taking on this responsibility, this challenge to implement an entire operating system. I appreciate you yes. softening the blow. Now, now <laughs> tell her all the things I did wrong. However, <laughs> yes. I went to boot camp and you know, they slap the toolbox up on the, on the yes. whiteboard and there are 20 tools in the toolbox. I think we were probably doing half of the tools. <laughs> Maybe. The other half, I, I had heard of a quarter of them, a quarter of them I had never even heard of before. So right. we, we definitely weren't doing it a hundred percent, but you know, the goal yeah. is to get 80% strong or better. And, and we weren't at 80%, but I think we were probably at about 60%. I don't think we were too far off. Mm-hmm. Um, even, but just, even some things we were doing, we weren't doing correctly. Like sure. the, a great example would be the scorecard. I'm oh, yeah. just found out a couple of days ago. So the way I built our scorecards and the way I encourage our team to build it was to think of their rocks and then reverse engineer their rocks. And so you can do that, but that was all of our scorecards turned into rocks. Like they were, they're building towards a rock. And so it did help clarify a lot of stuff for our sales team. We have a lot, we got a lot better at building out uh, weekly to do's to build towards our rock, but tracking things like number of complaints in a week, that's a really good thing to track, Mm. but it doesn't build towards a rock. And so yeah. why it's would I do it? Yeah. Right. It's a, it, it was a measurable that didn't build towards anything. So I just didn't do it. And uh, so I only just la- Amanda did our, our annual planning, our first two day annual planning. She ran better than the eight previous ones I ran, but she <laughs> ran it. And, uh, and that was a moment where in the meeting I'm pushing back. So I'm like, but this doesn't build to anything. And then there's this look around the room where everybody's like, we've been doing it wrong. Right. So there's so things there's, like there's that. There's a lot of undoing and trying yeah. to yes. reteach and that's okay. Um, it's actually a lot can of fun I, can for I interject me. Really quick? I think mm-hmm. one of the most important lessons from that is that most of us on the self implementing side who then hire an implementer, we feel like there's redundancy. We're like, well, let's just skip this part. But the problem is, yeah. is that within each section, there are things that we misinterpreted, did wrong, or that have improved since we uh, first read the book and first figured it out. There have been, imp- you know, it's, you, it's a EOS is an organization that innovates. And so if I implemented something or figured something out in 2018, it's, it's been improved since then, right. but I probably haven't. And so all of the redundancy is worth it to grab the nuggets and to grab the, the tweaks that then make the application so much more powerful. And so Absolutely. I encourage every self-implementer out there, don't skip through stuff because you feel like it's repeating. You have to do every step. Right. And, yeah. and I think yeah. that what that afforded us also was a new perspective uh, being in a franchise system with franchise owners who are also running their businesses on EOS, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we got into, um, this habit or this is this position where we were comparing ourselves to them. We were like, well, we're all running on EOS and we're definitely running on EOS the best compared Mm -hmm. to the other soccer shots owners, right? We were like, we're doing more, we're running better, we're running on EOS better than the rest of these guys. But we were comparing ourselves to other people, not to ourselves, you know? So then Mm. when we actually looked at what running on EOS actually looks like, pure, running pure, then we were able to take a big step back and take a real look in the mirror. And it was a reality check where we were like, whoa, we are not actually running on EOS to the extent that we think that we are. And we need Mm -hmm. to really unravel some things, unlearn some things, reinstall them. And we're running better than ever now. So um, yeah, now they have a professional EOS Mm in-house implementer, which- uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> That's fantastic. And look, I think we should say, I mean, we, we applaud self-implementers, right? We would That's much rather you start doing something with EOS than not do anything at all. But there is definitely an element of working with somebody, um, I think, first of all, externally, who's actually looking at from a different perspective as opposed to being in the business. Um, but also, as you said, there, there are 20 tools in the toolbox and more, the supplementary tools as well that we have for other um, you know, things that happen in the business. And, and generally, people who are self-implementing have got the foundational tools pretty much down pat, but there's a whole lot more that actually surrounds that and supports it. That's exactly it. And I just have to say, I'm completely out of operations. I'm sitting in the owner's box, so I'm not in the day-to-day. And I think that that's Mm. why I'm able to be the implementer for my own business is that I am really coming in as an outside perspective and, you know, the quarterly meetings, our annual planning meetings, those are the only meetings that I'm in. I'm not in the level 10 meetings every week. I'm not in the day to day. So I really am a coach on the sidelines coming in and um, watching those key plays and and coaching them along. So I don't think that it is um, really a reasonable expectation or option for every business owner to be able to then do what we did and go to boot camp, become an implementer and then implement for your own business might not work for everyone. But in our case, it works. And, And yes, like you said, there are so many additional tools that self-implementers aren't even really privy to um, and they will be implementing these foundational tools that will change their business immediately but then there are so many more things that you can uh, that you can learn along the way that will just take you to another level and we are constantly learning we're hungry to learn as implementers we're going to these uh, QCEs every mm-hmm. quarter we're going to breakout sessions and we're learning new things from our colleagues and uh, always honing our skills. So yeah. um, having that implementer in your back pocket is just key, I think, to taking your business to another level. You, you yeah. touched on something that um, I actually say frequently. Um, I say it's, it's just not possible to self-generate our own outside perspective. Mm-hmm. And so we can go up to the 30,000 foot view and look at our business, but we're looking down at ourselves. It's still not an outside perspective. And a lot of times the, the self implement or the, the, the hired implementer coming in, which like Amanda touched on, although she does own soccer shots, she has not been involved in operations for quite a while. And so she's able to come in with a very outside, fresh perspective, know the personalities of the people, know, know, know who's in the room, but, um, but still give them feedback that's from an outside perspective. And it's, it's invaluable to hear that. Uh, it's also really, really helpful. I, I've, I have found through personal experience um, and then any book that touches on it, when the boss, owner, leader of the organization shows vulnerability and accountability in front of the people that answered it to him or her, um, mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot easier to, to ask for that and to expect it from the people who answer to you. Now, if, if I never show any examples of being vulnerable, of being wrong, of asking for forgiveness, I mean, all this stuff is same as parenting, right? Um, yeah. If I never show those examples, then how am I going to be able to really expect that from them on a consistent basis? And and when I'm not around and when I'm not looking, like, how can I expect that? But if they're yeah. seeing me, me request that, speak about it and model it through having to say, oh my gosh, guys, I, I, I misinstalled scorecard one of the easiest ones that we do like one of the most yeah. not easiest but the most um tactile and tangible like one of those one of those ones that changes your business the next day and i, mm-hmm. I didn't do it correctly and so yeah. when they see that and they see me in the room like slump in the corner uh two days ago when i realized after eight years that i had only been doing about 70 percent of the value of a scorecard it, it's good for them to see that because yeah. one of the things that we tell them all the time is hey let's Let's all be okay with making mistakes. It's just we don't want to sit in a rut that keeps repeating the same mistake over and over again. And so oh, I want them to see me corrected and me make mistakes and then me do course corrections after that that don't repeat the same mistake from before. And so uh, um, I just think that when a self-implementer is honest with themselves, the biggest – even the smartest self-implementer out there, and I'm not claiming to be that person, but the smartest one out there can, can install everything perfectly. Like I'm, I'm saying that, that person probably exists. Yeah. But they yep. still can't self-generate the outside perspective that's needed. 
Yeah. And like Amanda said, we, we spend a lot of time on our own self, one of our values is grow or die. And, you know, we're at our QCs on a quarterly basis. We meet with our local implementers on a regular basis. We're always uh, engaging with the community. We are training all the time to be the masters of EOS and we're seeing it through different companies. So um, it's, I always, I love it. I love the fact that I get to work all these different businesses um, and, and I, I'm never there to give them the answers, but I can share some of those experiences or ask the right questions to make sure they get to the right answer in the room. I love it. Yeah. It's yeah. just having, having someone. So when I'm, when I'm trying to figure out a scorecard and I'm also defining it for people and I'm also like checking their scorecards and I'm fixing their score. It's just, and I'm trying to run the business. I'm just yeah. the wrong person to do it. And so mm-hmm. I believe there are supplement implementers out there that, that can have a much easier uh, run out that I did. I mean, I said 300 tracked hours before I really opened my mouth about it. Cause yeah. I just knew myself. I was like, I am so disorganized. I need no, what I, I did. I used the audible. So I listened to it ah, and, yes. then I, and then I had the book in front of me and I had a highlighter and I had a pad of paper. So yes. my parents, like I said, all my family are educators. So the, as the, the more senses you can engage in a learning experience, the higher the retention rate. So I was like, yeah. okay, touch the book, highlight it, listen to it. <laughs> it. I was like trying everything to, to, uh, to, to figure out a way to do it myself. But it just has been so different having having a, a professional implementer come in. I yeah. I will say though, uh, perfection is the em- enemy of of progress. And so, mm. if you're at a point, if perfection is an outside implementer coming in, but your revenue is not there to support that yet, you still need to start today. Because if you're not designing the business yourself, um, and you're not designing your own life, uh, then the business is designing uh, your life for you, and the for business you. is in control. And so EOS, even at the self-implementer level, is still um, creating structure that your employees will will appreciate. And it's and if nothing else, EOS over and over again is pushing you towards alignment over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And once you figure out that alignment um, can best be explained through a filter of core values, then you can start to actually have uh, um words, you, tangible words that you can use to explain why this isn't working between an employee and an employer or why an idea didn't work or why a certain customer base seems to never work very well for us. Uh, you can start to look at your values and then make course corrections that singularly focus on the most profitable, the most aligned, um, the best opportunities for giving and um, for space giving um, and, and the best opportunities for innovation within your industry. And I feel like our franchise has been an innovative franchise within our system of 240 franchises. And the reason is because before most other people in the system, we were structured. And so once you get the processes in place, and I remember going to a breakout session in 2018, where they spoke about processes and they said, how many visionaries are in the room? And I was like, front row. And, uh, and he was like, okay, you all think you hate processes because they're boring and they're restrictive and it's like a prison cell, but you're wrong. They're like, it is the key that unlocks the handcuffs. It, it is freedom because once you develop the process, you just hand the process to the people that execute it and you don't think about it ever again. If you don't have an identified uh, process followed by all, then you every time have to evaluate what everyone's doing, each individual person at each individual location, and you have to course correct each one of them the entire time they work for you. And every new person coming in, no matter how hard they try, is going to do it a little bit differently because they weren't trained by you. And so if you can create a process that trains them by you without you having to be there, uh, and and it, and it, it is the filter for how to do it over and over and over again correctly, you can just go and look at the process, look at how they're doing it, and, and easily find growth areas between what they're doing, which is maybe a little bit off and not aligned, and what you're asking for. And so once you get the process in place, and it's taken us time, it has honestly yeah. taken time, it was the, it was the uh, put this off and don't look at it for a while uh, project. And yes. I felt like every year we're like, okay, we need three processes this year, just three. Let's come up with three. And then we come up with one and then we document it. And at the end of the year, we're like, okay, let's feel good about this one. This year we do three. Uh, but but then learning to let people in charge of their own department, create their own processes. Um, and then we put that through the leadership team to review it. Like it just, it was the key to freedom. And I, I think for years I tried to get out of the business and kept getting pulled in every time there was employee turnover. 
But once yeah. we had processes in place, employee turnover didn't matter anymore when it came to my role in the company. Well, the quote is structure. Uh, what is that? Structure. Structure first. No, structure, uh, something, creativity. Uh, I'm losing it. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think I know it, so that's worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find it out. But uh, yeah, structure is the thing that enables you to be creative. It frees yeah. your creativity, right? Yeah. So I think for a leader, for a visionary especially, you think, oh, this is going to really hold me down and it's going to limit. Know, it feels like it's going to limit exactly. you. But yeah. it frees you. It frees you to be creative. It frees yeah. you. Oh up your time and your mind and, and you can innovate if, if you're a creative innovative person and you have the core uh you you have the process you can innovate off that process as an anchor and have a yep. lot more structure to your innovation and you can you can um you can identify things that are working and things that aren't working a lot more quickly when you have mm -hmm. this process and that does work and you're trying to innovate the process a little bit um if you don't have that first that totally. core process of this is how we do it then you're just trying this and then trying that and then trying that and then trying that with no real organization, no structure to it, very, very little accountability, no measurables. Um, and so processes is what helped us to start become more and more creative. And I don't want to give Amanda all the credit, but, um, oh boy, she's going to get a process book. She's going to get the process book. Yeah. Process, but this is the first year that we hired her 2022, um, yes. and had a professional implementer. And this is by far the biggest growth year we've ever had. We grew by 76.7%. Wow. That's uh, awesome. That's what I was gonna, actually going to ask you. I wanted to know what the impact was. Because, um, of course, 2022 was actually last year. So she's been doing it for the full year in 2022. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Started yeah. right at the very beginning, February. Excellent. So how, what was that growth rate? 76.7%. Our wow. previous best year ever was 28% growth, which is amazing. Um, I, I yeah. was happy with 28 yeah, yeah. But this is an established business that's been going for years. Because this is the thing that I love about um, EOS is like people sort of think, oh, well, we've been going for years. There's not much more that we can do. You probably can't improve the business too much more. And yet after all these years and using EOS, just by being a bit more EOS pure, 76.7%. That is fantastic. Well done, you two. <laughs> yeah. And also yeah. for anyone who's thinking about, um, about growing, it, yeah. If you're going to have multiple locations and you don't have an operating system in place, you're in big mm -hmm. trouble. You don't know it yet. Um, you're yeah. in big trouble because here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to that other location. You're going to spend a ton of time focusing on it and you're going to get it just right. Then you're going to go back to the original one and be like, oh no, like it started drifting the minute I walked over to that one. So then you're going to get this one back on course again. And then you go yeah. over there and you find out that what you said or what you modeled was misunderstood and now you're off course. And it's over and over and over again. And the quickest way to build an organization that simply multiplies is to not have a structure in place. And so I know EOS says it all the time, but structure first, people second. People second. Once you figure yeah. out the structure and you just duplicate that structure everywhere, you know exactly what you're looking for. You know exactly who you're looking for to fill each role in the organization because you've already done it once. That is the best way to grow. It's, it's the most profitable way to grow and it, the least stressful and the most sleep at night is having that structure in place. Cause I, I mean, yeah. I wasn't before EOS, I was up at two, three in the morning all the time. Um, yeah. I called it, I, I, I said, I excused it. And I said, it's because well now it's finally quiet and I can focus, but there's no reason to be up at three o'clock in the morning working on your business every day. There's no reason. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's that, unless you, unless you have a business, that's not going to work. That's, that's one. <laughs> yeah, very but, well. uh, but I just encourage anyone who's thinking to have multiple locations when you can't touch it, you have to have something in place that's organizing it for you. And then the scorecard is just how you stay on top of it. Sure. And Amanda's looking at the book now, which is obviously the process book, which is by Peyton. And um, who's the other author? I've, um, Lisa Gonzalez. That's right, Lisa. Of course. Yeah. Um, now that, that is, that's the book that kind of changed process for me too, because as a visionary, I was the same. It was like, actually, I'm not really fond of process. And, and I think one of the quotes that I think Peyton actually said was, it's around that actually as entrepreneurs in the beginning, we actually looked for something and a different way of doing something in order to create our business. That's what entrepreneurs do. They look for that opportunity. They create a different way of doing it. And then they go out there. That actually is process. And so we need to then take that kind of secret source and teach other people how to do it so that we 
really can, as you said, duplicate. But also, if you get this right, you actually truly are delegating rather than abdicating as well, because you're saying, hey, I want you to do this work. And this is the the, the process that we follow around here versus abdicating, which is pretty much like, well, you just do it. Um, and I'm not going to give you any time or show you how to do it. Just get on with it. So it's a really important book. And that, that book is just phenomenal. I, I've really enjoyed reading it. Did we find the quote yet, Amanda? I haven't <laughs> found it, but uh, I, it's going to drive me nuts if I can't get it exactly correct. I, re- I think it's structure frees creativity. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what it comes down to. You, you need to be able to live in that space of freedom, of freedom of your mind, freedom of your thoughts, freedom um, as an entrepreneur. And Gino actually wrote the foreword. And he said, to enjoy freedom, we have to control ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's, that's exactly what Jobin was touching on in the beginning of this podcast is, is, is your business controlling you? Or are you controlling your business? Uh, it's mm-hmm. all about that control, the structure and the discipline. And when you instill those things in your business, it allows you to have the freedom to become a more creative person and uh, it gives you freedom of time and it's just yeah. a game changer. And you get to get back to doing what you love, which is what I've always, you know, really enjoyed. Right. So you actually sort of, you're not, you're not doing the stuff that you hate day in and day out. Hey, you know, I'm conscious of time, but I did want to ask you about the the, the Rockstar of the Year franchise award, because that was all about giving back, wasn't it? So do you want to explain to me a little bit about how you won that award and what this giving back thing is for you? I know you've sure. touched on it before. To but... it. I'd love to actually tie it to EOS. Um. Before EOS, core values were, were um, man, they were an abstract theory for me. I, I didn't really understand what, like, I, I know I have values, and mm-hmm. I know some of them are core, but uh, I think the most of the examples I'd seen of core values were you, you, you're in some office, you go into the bathroom, and on the way to the bathroom, on the hallway, there's a, there's a, a picture of an eagle, and it says, we soar to new heights, core value number one. <laughs> you're like, yeah. okay. And you remember every time you have to go to the bathroom, other than that, you never think about it. And that was really what I thought of core values. Um, EOS, the structure of EOS, getting to the, getting, going through the process of identifying core values and, and, um, and, and then learning how to apply them. For me, um, I had gone years trying to figure out, like, how do I attract the people that are passionate about what I'm passionate about? And learning to identify the core values. So take what's in my head, put it out on paper. Uh, um, and then incorporate it into not just not just the start of a of a annual meeting with all of our team there Christmas party. It's not we don't we don't sit around and recite our core values. That that's not when we use it. We use it during our hiring. We use it during um, every promotion, every uh, challenging conversation. We're calling someone up to a little bit better performance. Uh, we'll talk about values. Uh, we had a challenging situation with with uh, an employee not too long ago where something had happened. Um, some mistakes have been made and he actually thought that this conversation was him on the way out the door and instead the conversation was an affirmation of hey one of our core values is we own it and we're very proud of you um we're you know this this could have been something that derailed your future with us but you actually lived out a core value through a challenging experience and we're very grateful for that thank you and it 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 blew his mind he couldn't believe it he said at the end he goes this is this is the opposite direction I thought this conversation was going to go. And I would say, um, candidly, he is definitely in line for future opportunities um, with us and growth within the organization because of that core value alignment. And so mm-hmm. when it came to uh, to recruiting people uh, to join our organization and having the interview process, you know, one of our core values is, uh, is help first. Uh, we really want to be an organization that helps people. And so our, our interview is in thirds. The first third, um, I, it's 20 minutes where I try to help them win interviews. I teach them what we're looking for. I talk to them about the old days of interviews and I try to help them. Then the second part, I talk to them about what, who we stand for. So, so, or what we stand for and what we are actually doing. So everyone on the outside sees a children's soccer company, a successful children's soccer company training 10,000 children. Uh, mm-hmm. But internally, our profits are used to sponsor hundreds of projects internationally. Um, and, and all of our staff knows that I didn't even used to tell our staff. I didn't tell her, I was like, Oh, I don't want to brag. It's like, so dumb. 
And so yeah. now we tell those stories. And in that middle third of the interview, I'm actually, what this is the hint for anybody who sees this and then applies. I'm actually looking for an emotional response. I'm an emotional guy. And so I'll tear up on some of these things. I'm not looking for anyone else to tear up. I'm just looking for an emotional. Are they grinning from ear to ear when I'm talking about um, the mother of four kids whose cancer treatments we were able to pay for? Like, is that, does that evoke an emotion or a, or a, um, a, um, a connection to something they've experienced? Or when we talk about the funerals of children that we, that are connected to our academies that have been killed in civil war conflicts that we've been able to pay for, does that, does that impact them? Or at the end, when I say, Hey, so I want to hear like, what, you know, what's your connection to our company, our stories, what, what resonated, what our why? Um, if their answer, I love Simon Sinek. So if it, when I'm trying to, when I've asked them questions, if they connect to her or why, if their answer is something like, oh, I just really love soccer and it's so fun, like giving that to little kids. I'm like, okay, you didn't really hear me, right? And so one thing that I love to say to all, or I, I, I make a point of saying to all of our team internally is these are our core values. That means that out of 20 great things we could be doing, we have four that we've identified as the first four in our list of 20. All mm -hmm. 20 are awesome amazing and if your favorite four are you know the the last four on our list it just means there's a different company that you could be working at that's going to let you live out your values every day these four are ours so we want to invite you to to come and work here if you if you look at these values and you say yes I identify with them so actually the the last part of the interview process is just a value process it's 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 like it's an alignment interview and at the end of it, so they've already been, you know, I, I've cheated a little bit. They've already been um, evaluated and our, my directors have already said, yes, this would make a great employee by the time they get to me. Now they don't know that yet. By the time they get to me, we've already decided, yes, we want to move forward. So I tell them our story and then I say, hey, take 24 hours, take 48 hours and decide. You have a mm -hmm. job, offer, but you decide, is this something that you want to do? And does this let you live out your passion to serve your community? And if, if it is, you're going to love working here. It's never going to feel like work. You're going to work with some of your best friends and you're going to have so much fun. But if these values are not your values and you have different ones that are equally strong and equally good, but just different, then it's going to feel like work. And when there's a little bit extra to do, or when a family needs you to go at the extra mile to do something for their child, to give them a, a, an exceptional experience, a remarkable experience, it's going to feel like a heck of a lot like work. And so don't take the job. Um, and so that's kind of our, our process. So we have everybody internally who is rowing the same direction. We are a giving organization. Every time we get above six kids in a class, all of our coaches know that a portion of, of that, then the profits, we're profitable around six, seven kids, depends on the, the location. But every yeah. kid after that, a portion, a percentage is going towards these projects. And so all of our team is excited. Uh, every, every time we get together, every quarter we talk, the highlight is, is telling the stories of impact. Uh, this last, um, just this last quarter. November, December, this last quarter, uh, we, we finished, we, we, we launched a school in Cameroon for 130 kids. They haven't had any schooling in that area since 2017. The next thing they do, they send me pictures of the kids celebrating, right? A song of the kids singing, we're going to school today. We're going to super cute song. And I oh. see a picture of the kids swimming in a, in a dirty puddle of water with buckets beside it. And so I grew up in a third world country. So my first question is, is that also their drinking water? And they said, yes, we have a lot of um, sanitation issues. We have a lot of illness and disease from waterborne, um, waterborne sickness. And I was like, okay, next project. So um, we just completed uh, right actually the day before Christmas. That was the goal. It was Christmas Day. But I think it was the day before Christmas we completed a project to uh, run uh, piping from a natural spring uh, miles and miles to this school and mm. and tried fresh water and so we then we get videos of kids getting tap water for the first time in their life and uh super rewarding and then i get a message that says this is so cool nine villages are using this one tap of water and i'm like oh no yeah. so then that starts our next project which is <laughs> which now we're digging a well by the four furthest oa ones which are is mostly farming community which means that they're having more access to water for farming which means more food for the kids and so that's mm. how our projects have gone and for you know, since 2012, we really haven't told people outside of our company what we do. Uh, then our franchisor, uh, um, Kevin, who's the, the president of Soccer Shots Franchising, uh, he submitted us, uh, recommended us to FBR, the Franchise Business Review, for this award, the Giving Back Award to Franchise Rockstar. And so out of uh, 300,000 franchises, we were selected 
Um, it was pared down to 276 franchises for seven awards. And, um, and then they picked us. And so now we actually have a little bit of a platform to talk about what we've never talked about before, which is the most important side of what we do. Um, and, and I believe it is the core that attracts such great people to work for us. So if you're going to take a company from training 63 kids to training 10,000 kids a year, you need to have hmm. exceptional people working for you. And not I just, not just good at what they do but exceptional people. And I have to say, uh, you touched on it earlier, you know, when we were talking about our growth rate over this past year, we're 13 years in business and we're mm -hmm. in a business in a um, industry where there's a high turnover rate. So coaches on average will stay about 60, six to 18 months, maybe yep. that's about the average um, nationally here in Orange yep. County. We have four coaches this year that are celebrating 10 years with soccer shots, Orange County. So we are able to not only attract great people, people who are aligned with our core values and who are invested in our why, who understand it, internalize it, want to be a part of it, and come alongside our family to accomplish these things, but they also stay. We retain them for a very long time, much higher mm. than any other Soccer Shots franchise across the country and in our industry. Um, so we, we also, that, we actually have people who haven't worked for us since 2012 that still come to our company Christmas party. And so we just, we just yeah. build relationships with people you've and built, you've created a, a family the, community. Yep. Yes. One of the things that we tell them during the interview, and then we repeat it, we repeat it on the way out the door when they're going, is we say, if you honor this relationship while we work together and you honor it on the way out the door, we will be in your corner for the rest of your life. And 2019, I got a phone call. And it was from a, a, a friend of mine named Phil Modi. And he called me up out of the blue. He's like, hi, this is Phil. I don't know if you remember me. And I was like, well, I've only had three Kenyans work for me in my entire life. So I definitely remember who you are, Phil. And he just laughed and he said, hey, you said that you would, um, you would always help me if, if I ever came to you and, and I had a problem that you would help me. If I, if, if I worked hard for you, and he said, if I worked hard for you and, and you know, we had a good relationship, you said you'd be there. And I said, yes, I, 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 I did say that. And he said, well, uh, my brother and I have spent every dollar we have. Our sister was widowed um, recently. Her husband passed away in a car accident, and then she was diagnosed with stage three cervical cancer. Um, she's in, in Kenya. They sent her home from the hospital. We have no more money to pay for treatment, and they sent her home to die, but she has four kids, and we can't let this happen. So I was like, oh, boy. Well, I don't really have savings to pay for cancer treatments, but I do own a business, and, and as you know, a business can get access to, to capital that an individual can't. And so mm -hmm. I said, we can't, we can't wait to fundraise. We can't wait. Like there's no delay. Yeah, there's no um, time. It, it was yeah. an eight hour bus ride home from the hospital that she barely survived um, and just intense pain. And, and so I said, we, we got to get her on that bus tomorrow. Like, let's see what we can do. So it took, it took six days and we were able to secure all the funding we needed. Um, we told them like, get her on the bus. I'm going to start sending money right now. Um, I, I, I want to point out a, an organization called Boss Revolution. Um, it's a it's a company that does money transfers internationally, and the owner's yep. name is Shia, and he has become a partner of mine in the sense that there are there are countries where you can't get money into because mm -hmm. they are um, there are conflict zones, and the challenge is the company that's transferring the money if the comp if the if the money is going to support a conflict on uh, either side of the conflict that money that that organization can lose a lot of opportunity, and they can be mm -hmm. shut out of that country completely for sending money there. So Shia heard my story, uh, took a chance on me, and Shia helps me get money into really challenging areas because he, he knows me, he trusts me. Um, I'm so grateful for him. He's helped us do so much. Uh, but one of the things that's been really amazing is then to hear our employees telling other people about what they do. They're so, oh, I, I, went, I told my parents about this job and they're just so proud of me. And I'm like, so that is a, that's an emotional thing for me to be creating yeah. employment for people that they're actually bragging to their parents and their significant others and people who they care who, people whose opinions they value they're telling them about where they work and it's here and they know that we walk the talk and so they see us living out our core values they see us doing these things for past employees for other people and they know that and they can be secure in knowing that we will do that for them if that is the case one day and yeah and I think that that really helps to create this trusting, lasting relationship. Two, two yeah. quick stories that are not, um, so 
for so long, we've had to focus on third world countries because that uh, our dollar goes so far there. And I, you know, yeah. the the well that we just added is five thousand dollars to add that well, right? Where it, it's it's not an insignificant amount of money, but it's also not an eighty thousand dollar well we're digging in Orange County. It's five thousand, yep. and so we mm-hmm. can do so much more when we're when we're focusing on on these other locations. And so when we expanded to Hawaii, we really wanted to find something something local there in the U.S. that we that we could support. And we found a program called Project Hawaii. And so um, starting, we, we, took, we, we met with them before we even purchased the franchise. And we said, hey, we want to become financial partners with you guys. There, there are 23,000 unsheltered homeless children living um, on the Big Island, Maui, and Oahu. I had no idea. I would vacationed in Hawaii mm. before, and I was a typical vacationer, uh, blind, to, blind to what's going on outside of the glitter of the vacation areas. And, yeah. and so being able to come alongside and financially support an organization like that. And we're starting this month, we're donating uh, 7% of our, of our profits to them every month. It's just a check that gets cut uh, from that, mm-hmm. from that business. Um, it, it is a tangible representation of what's in our heart, which is to be a, a helping giving organization and for our employees to coach and know that money generated by coaching these classes, if they do a great job, the classes grow. And when the classes grow, then that money goes to help, kids on the island that don't have access to food on the weekends. They don't have access to school supplies. They get free summer camps through this organization called Project Hawaii. And so that's been really rewarding to finally find um, something local. I did say two. Local, yeah. I forgot one of them. That's we'll okay. just go with that one. That's okay. We're, we're, gonna, we're running out of time anyway, so I'm going to have to probably um, cut you short there. But I can see the passion. I can see um, how much you've created, and I'm really thrilled by the work that you're doing and what's going on. You did still have three t- um, tips that you wanted to share to the listeners. Um, I don't. You're going to share them with me, so tell me what they are. Yeah. We'll run through them quickly. I know we're running out of time, but our yes. thing, like like when we first started our giving projects, we had forty one dollars in the bank account. You, you don't need to have a lot of cash available to start helping people. Absolutely. If yeah. there's a need, you can fill it. Trust me. If you live in North America, if you live, if you don't live in a third world country, you are blessed beyond measure and you have something to give. So we mm-hmm. like to think of those things that you have to give as your time, your treasure, and your talent. So those will be our three tips for today. So number one, your time. And that can look like a lot of different things. And, and it does transfer from professional to personal. Also, we, um, we think time is a currency. So like we said earlier, when uh, we were building our organization, uh, time was part of our vision, time with our children. But time with each other also is really important to us. Um, mm-hmm. Today's Friday in the United States of America. I know where you are, it's Saturday, but... Yeah. Friday for us is called Friday My Day. I've been hashtagging it. It's not catching. No one else is doing it. <laughs> it's officially our hashtag. But we Excellent. have, we've designed our life. Uh, we, we, I know you've had Scott Rusnak on and he talks about designing your yeah. life before someone designs it for you. We have been really intentional in designing our life along those same lines. And we block off Fridays as our day. So sometimes we go for a massage or we go out for lunch or we, we do something fun together, but we block Friday off and, and this is fun for us. So uh, you're not encroaching on oh, Friday. Good. Friday at all. <laughs> Thank you for but, yeah, um, good. Time is important and, and you can't get back time, right? Once it's gone, it's gone. So um, time is our number one tip. And what would you have to say as far as time and giving? Time. Sometimes time has looked a lot like me traveling, you know, 36 hours to Rwanda to run a training course for 36 athletic directors, teaching them how to incorporate character development in their lesson plans. Um, mm-hmm. That I, I wasn't giving a gift financially that in that in that in that, uh, in that day when I ran that that camp but, or that uh, that training seminar. But I but I was donating a lot of time away from my family. That was actually a combination of all three, but. Um, it, yeah. it was a significant time away from the family, but sometimes time looks like um, knowing that you have a friend in need and showing up for them when no one else is. Uh, that's mm-hmm. you can donate time helping someone move. No one likes doing it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's no one likes moving, and so when you show up and help someone do something that they don't like doing, oh man, yeah. the appreciation level is through the roof. So that's a good example I of time is showing. Up completely like agree. Yeah. 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 What about so- treasure then? Your second yeah. is treasure. So treasure obviously is um, your monetary uh, investments or your or monetary your donations. Sure. Opening so we all have treasure, uh, whether that's 
the things that we've acquired, the money that we have in the bank, but whatever you have, um, give freely. So every little bit counts. And we saw that in the early years of our donation projects, our very first donation project, like Jobin said, we had $41 in our bank account. We were struggling, but we had a friend in Peru, a local Peruvian who Jobin grew up with that was essentially trying to do the same thing as we are doing here with our soccer shots business. Only he had 40 kids enrolled in his program and four flat soccer balls and a broke down motorcycle. So we knew even though we had little at the time, we had more than he had. So we just thought, how can we start scraping things together and give him whatever we have, you know? So uh, we started asking for donations from friends and family and colleagues. Um, we got a lot of soccer balls donated and um, some money and every little bit counts. I can tell you that. Yeah. So uh, whatever you have to give, then give that freely. And I'm telling you, it comes back around whatever you believe in. If you believe in God or the universe or whatever is at work for you, uh, karma or whatever, that is so true. I've seen it happen time and time again. The more that we give, the more we get in return. So yeah. um, giving of your treasure is just so important and give. 20, 2020 was, was a very challenging year for, for many industries, but especially mm -hmm. what's connected to youth sports that happen on campus at schools. So when parents were shut out of the school, we were shut out of the school. And then when kids were shut out of the school, we were definitely shut out of the school. Um, and so it, what was my point on that? I do this sometimes. Just I'm a high scoring visionary. Giving. I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> giving when you don't have anything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So in 2020, we Yeah. So that was, sorry. Nothing. She helps me get back on track when the train goes off a little bit. Good. So 2020 <laughs> was by far our biggest giving year, by far. That that yeah. um, organization that we had, had supported in 2012, in 2020, we actually built a soccer complex for them. Um, we had the savings in place and, you know, when, when, a, when a pandemic or any type of thing like, like that, not, it doesn't have to be as big as a pandemic, a but when any kind of crisis happens, that's when the, that's when the giving is needed more, but mm. people give a lot less. And so yeah. um, the need has gone up and the, the help has gone down. And so the fastest way to undermine your core values, the fastest way to undermine any project you're doing is to just not show up. Um, mm. And so for us, we said, this, this is not, um, we can't not show up today. We have to show up. And so yeah. we, we built the field, built all that, just did it in faith. We're like, this is the right thing to do. Uh, the, the time is now. We couldn't wait. We had to do it. And then 2021 was, um, was a shocking bounce back year. Let's just put it that way. Like we <laughs> did not anticipate the, um, all the way through August was basically nothing. And then it just exploded. And then 2022 was 78% above, 76.7% above our best year, not above 2020. That was an easy okay, year, yeah. but it was <laughs> yes. above our best year. So, um, wow. Yeah, time, treasure, and, okay. and then talent. Yeah, so the third one is your talent. Um, yeah. And, you know, Jobin has given of his talent as far as his business expertise and uh, being able to train people. Um, with what he's learned in our industry with training and education and, and soccer. So he's been able to go overseas and give of that talent. And, uh, and it's just something that we all have, you know, our unique ability, that Dan Sullivan term that we teach in EOS. And um, if you really step back and think about how you can use your unique ability, that gift that you've been given, um, to make the world a better place and impact your community. That is uh, a thing that we think is really valuable and important. We all, we all have unique abilities. And yeah. um, I love the phrase because it, it's perfect. The curse of knowledge. Um, we all have these abilities that other people don't have um, or, or that other people need, simply that other people need access to. And we devalue them because we know them already or they become, they, they're super easy for us. And mm -hmm. just because something is easy, simple, makes sense for us, it doesn't make, mean it makes sense for anyone else mm -hmm. in our community. And so um, a lot of times we, we get trapped in the, I have nothing to offer because we don't value what we do have to offer enough. And so if we can, if we can sit back and we can just look for ways, if we hear of a need, the key is to, to, um, to give yourself enough time, you know, take a clarity break, uh, have that, have that empty piece of paper and that pen and that tall cup of coffee um, and just sit there and just brainstorm. Like how could what I do help? And for us, I think, I think the, um, 
the aha moment for me personally, and this is my practical application of these three things, was that um, soccer or football, depending on where you're from, um, is for many communities, it is the pathway out of cyclical generational oppression and poverty. And, and that's why you see so many kids trying to become professional football players, soccer players in, in third world countries. It is seen as the pathway out. And they, they all have examples on TV of people who made it. The truth is, is that that path goes two directions. And so just as it can take people from deep out of, out of poverty, out of, out of really isolated communities in the quote unquote middle of nowhere, you can get mm. access into those communities. And so we were able to sponsor, for example, we sponsored projects in Ethiopia where we were, um, we were teaching and training coaches to go out into really rural areas and they would just set up a soccer field and the kids all come out for a free soccer camp. And then who follows mom, dad, uh, neighborhood community, they all come out. And so then our coaches, the coaches that we had um, supported training, they would dismiss the, the, the players, the children, and then they would talk to the parents about the importance of, of boiling water, so safe water practices, and then they would talk about HIV AIDS awareness. And they were doing that through a little free little children's soccer camp. And so that was a big aha moment for me because I was, I was doing the same thing. I was sitting here going like, well, what can I really offer? I run like a little kid soccer program, but I had a, I had a skill set to build a funnel into an academy. So if you have a competitive academy starting at 9, 10, 11, year, 12 years old, which is where they typically start, we work with two to eight-year-olds. And so if, yeah. I can, if I can build a funnel that funnels kids into the sport and I can teach other academy directors how to do that, I don't have to be better than them at soccer. I don't have to be better than them at running a competitive program. I don't have to beat any of their teams in a tournament. I just come in and say, hey, that's your area of expertise. Mine is I will teach you how to build a funnel. And it starts with repositioning yourself as an educator and a mentor within your community. Are you willing to listen? And, that, and that's how we've been able to invite change in a lot of communities yeah. from Rwanda to Ethiopia to Kenya to Cameroon to Peru um, and still looking for more projects. And just to um, tie that up with a nice little bow, one thing that we like to ask ourselves every day is not have I done enough, but what more can I do? So considering those three things, your time, treasure, and talent, we all have something to give. So take a big step back, look at the needs in your community locally, look at the needs in other communities overseas or internationally, and ask yourself, not have I done enough, but what more can I do? What more can I do? Oh. You guys are an absolute inspiration. I really um, have learned such a lot from today's talk and, and really inspired by what you're doing. So um, congratulations you. on all you've achieved business-wise, but thank you for all that you do for everything else as well. Um, I should imagine some people listen to this probably going, oh, I want to have a chat to these people. I want to find out more. How do they get in contact with you? There are a lot of ways to get in contact with us. We're very active online, on social media. So we have a family website called Barky Family Super 7, or sorry, not website, but a platform. So we're on Instagram yep. with our Barky Family Super 7. I have my Amanda Barky EOS Instagram. Uh, and then additionally, we have our Soccer Shots uh, website. So you can just Google Soccer Shots Orange County, Soccer Shots uh, Oahu, Hawaii. Um, yep. and, but and but the can... easiest, quickest way to access us is just four words, Barky Family Super 7. Um, that will always on, get to on us. Instagram. If people yeah. message us there, okay. we always reply to them. There's a there's an auto response, but we that just tells them we're going to get to them as soon as we can. But we do we do talk to everyone on there. Yeah. You guys are amazing. Hey, look, thank you so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, please go and enjoy the rest of your um, Friday my time. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> and I look forward to hopefully catching up with you guys in person very soon. Wonderful. Oh, it's thank great to meet so you. Much, thank you. Th thank you. Thanks. <laughs>